The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, lady, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Gig webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is the era of conversational question answering computers and cognitive systems. Our guest speaker today is Subramaniam Thuraga. He is a solutions manager, Worldwide Global System Integrated Alliance with IBM Software Group. Subram Thraga comes with a bachelor engineering degree in computer science and he is an IIM Calcul Calcutta alumnus. He holds an MBA in international business. His IT industry experience spans services, products, R&D, alliances, consulting and sales. In his present role as Worldwide Software Solutions Manager and Alliance Technical Relationship Manager, his passion is to promote innovative solutions to global enterprises on IBM's cutting-edge technology. So, without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Subramaniam. Thank you, Anuradha. That was a uh, nice introduction about me. Thanks. Uh, now, off to the session. Uh, welcome uh, all my participants across the India. Uh, I will take 45 minutes for the session and we will have a 15 minutes uh, question and answer after this. So the today's topic will be on uh, an innovative technology that IBM uh, recently uh, launched after a lot of research and development called the Watson technology. So we will see what is Watson, how this technology works and uh, how, uh, what this technology is all about. I will also show you a few use cases and uh, one industry case study of what Watson did in the real life. In the due course, I will also explain the GeoParty game for which the Watson was first made public and I will uh, show you a few pointers on how do you know more about this and how do you get uh, an access to this technology. So without delay, starting to the session. Uh, many of you might be knowing uh, about IBM Deep Blue, which was a computer made by IBM in uh, 1990s. Uh, this was a computer IBM made for a specific purpose of, of demonstrating a, a point. That was a time when computers were seen as big calculators. Uh, doing only what they are instructed to do and uh, never able to achieve anything more than uh, a machine. Basically, the, the world was believing that computer can never challenge a human being. So that was the time IBM took that deep blue exercise and we made a computer that plays chess, not only just playing as per the rules, but plays with humans in real time and we made this computer uh, to play a game against the then world's chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue won the game. So that was a game changer in the uh, history of computers that a computer is able to perform some activities like a human being and also beat the best of the human being. But what the Deep Blue was only about the computational capability and the speed of a machine. We just had a chess algorithm and the Deep Blue played that well by make, making good use of the resources and it won. There was nothing more to it than a human touch. So we wanted to do more research on that line. So we wanted to uh, study how humans think, how the human brain works whether a computer can ever perform like a human brain, understand the natural language and deal with the decisions that we take in our lives. So that thought process gave to a machine uh, which we took to a game called GeoParty. So I'll first explain what is GeoParty 
what is why it is the right stage and then I will explain the machine that we made. Geopardy is a game uh, of quiz. It's, uh, it's a very popular US game which was played um, for um, many years across multiple series. You can compare that to a Kaun Banega Karolpati in India where uh, questions will be very brainy and one need to know the answer very thoroughly to, to walk out of the game as a winner. And there are some differences too when you compare to KBC. You will not have ABCD option. So you need to be very sure on what you are uh, answering. You need to really know the subject. You can't guess because there is no uh, multiple choice to guess. And it's a buzzer round, time based game. So you need to be very quick. In the start of the game, you will be shown with uh, six categories. Uh, not only these categories, but categories will be chosen from few dozens. So it cha keeps changing for every game. And there will be an amount of uh, bets available to you. So depending on your confidence of the chosen category, you will choose a number, amount, and then you will bet on that. Then a question will be displayed to you, to all the players, and they need to press the buzzer. For example, if you choose technology, a question may be like uh, all policemen can thank Stephanie Walker for her invention in this polymer fiber, five times stronger than steel. You need to know what exactly is that fiber. And the answer will be in the form of uh, what is Kevlar, which is the answer for that. So you need to know that subject very well. They will show an answer first and you need to give a question which results in that answer. Whoever presses the buzzer and answers that word Kevlar correctly will walk out as, a, as the uh, winner of this question and this continues for several rounds in the, in the game. Whoever bags the maximum money by answering maximum number of questions at maximum level of confidence level by betting on big money uh, lots will walk out as a winner. So we um, we made Watson uh, a, a machine which can play this game and we brought the machine to play against uh, human beings in real time. So we made uh, uh, the, the machine as one of the contestants and the other two contestants were the best contestants ever of that game series. Uh, Ken Jennings won 74 games of Geopardy in a row and he made 2.5 million dollars out of this game. So it's like a career for him. And the uh, uh, other player you see Brad Rutter, uh, he, wa he won the highest cumulative amount ever by a single player in the history of Geopardy. He made 3.2 million money uh, but he doesn't answer as many questions correct as Ken. So Brad goes by his intuition and he bets on the questions that he knows and he bets a higher amount on them. So these two players are the best of the Geopardy game series and you can say these are the best of the human brains to answer Geopardy. So we made uh, the machine that we made called Watson to play against these two people and at the end of the game, uh, Watson made $77,147, whereas Ken Jennings made only $24,000 and Brad made only $21,000. So it won the game with a whopping difference, uh, a very clear margin. So we made our point very clear that a computer can compete with human beings in our native field of thinking, analyzing, conversing. That was a uh, very uh, puzzling thing uh, for uh, the technology space because no one ever succeeded in that space, though the research on these uh, fields was happening for several decades. And in 2011, when this series was telecasted, the whole attention of the IT industry was on Watson to study how Watson actually won the game. So in my session, going forward, I will be explaining what that Watson is, how it won the game, and what do we want to do. Another reason why we took up Watson 
uh, after uh, doing several projects like uh, Deep Blue is when Deep Blue won the chess, it was only to prove a technical point. Okay, what Deep Blue won chess, but there is no potential for that to try any business possibilities for that. We couldn't uh, sell that to say any customer for industry problem, or we couldn't help the world in getting any any way better by by getting uh, Deep Blue to play the chess. That is one of the area why uh, we did Watson experiment very clearly with a clear focus on what we need to do on that. Now with the uh, proven ability of a computer able to understand natural language, there is a wide door open on conversational systems which can be adopted to every industry where people just ask the questions and the computer responds to them. If you take a uh, study of what kind of questions come in uh, Geopardy, there is no repetition, there is no pattern in that. You cannot uh, synthesize any structured information or a pattern which can be programmed to a computer. It is highly unpredictable. And if you see the uh, graph that we plotted uh, on where do st humans stand in answering questions like this and dealing with the answers of varying degrees of confidence before they press the button and put forward their answer. Average human being stays many levels above a computer at, at that time. And you can see in the red dots that a grand champion stays even uh, to the right side of that cloud where they are very good at answering questions with less confidence level. This is a space where uh, computers didn't even enter for decades because a computer has a binary logic. If you ask it uh, to search in your customer database and find out the list of customers who bought some product, then it will just run a query and it will give an answer to you. It will be an S or no answer. There is nothing in between. It's only binary. Computers never dealt with anything gray, anything which is subjective, anything which, which is uh, to, do, to deal with varying degrees of confidence. That's what we worked on. And as we worked on this to, to get the Watson prototype better and better, we were able to uh, achieve the human level of performance and even exceed. And then we have put that to the geopathy. Several things were remarkable in Watson. Um, three salient dimensions of Watson put it uh, apart from the computers that we know. First, it understands natural human language. It understands the English that uh, we all speak and it can read things like how we read. In Geopardy game, uh, we didn't deal with speech recognition part or text synthesis for answer because that is a space where a lot of research has already been done and it's not a great thing. Today we have uh, Android and Apple phones which can understand your voice and convert that into text. And we also have a lot of software from IBM to do that. A decade ago itself we, we uh, had a product called WebSphere Translation Server which was used by uh, heads in US who started operations in Germany. Uh, they took the customer questions on customer support in German language in email and they were translated on this software and sent to the uh, US uh, SMEs. So there's no challenge in that space. So we wanted to put more focus on how do you understand the semantics of the human language. Uh, for example, how do you understand nouns and pronouns? How do you understand the uh, pun and wit in our conversation? How do you sense the emotions? How do you understand the different meanings of a word based on the context? That's where we put focus on. And we also uh, uh, focused on how a machine can learn on its own and continue its learning uh, further to deal with any type of question. It's practically not possible to give a pattern or write algorithms to feed all sorts of possibilities before we send somebody for a quiz answering. 
So this is another field where the computer acts like a human being, learning on its own, remembering what it learns, and then building on top of that. So this is an artificial intelligence space, and this we call this learning as uh, uh, andragogic learning, which is like adult learning. Uh, as opposed to a child's learning where we learn A, B, C first and the words next and then the sentences where we really understand the meaning of that. We start with the adult approach where we know many things already and we also know what we want to learn next. We know why we want to learn and we just go to the resources and learn specific to that context. For example, when I prepare for a presentation, I just go find the materials relevant for that, uh, say Watson materials, and then my, I prepare my presentation. I don't care about the rest of the information in the whole world or even in the whole IBM. This approach is tuned into Watson. The third dimension, uh, computers were only dealing with zero or one binary logic so far. So we trained Watson on how to deal with an answer of grayscale, an answer which it's not unsure, but how to validate, how to put a uh, case for that and validate the case on whether that could be a candidate answer or not. So we will see uh, all these three in, uh, in detail going forward. If you see the type of questions that a computer can answer, for example, uh, you give a big number and ask that uh, to be multiplied with pi and squared and divide with another very big number. These are very good for a computer to do and these are very difficult for a human being to do. If I ask you to do the sum and tell the answer to me right now, you will not be able to uh, do that. You will take a lot of time. But a computer can answer this in a fraction of a second. Computers can also deal with structured information. For example, if I ask that to uh, do a database query and then tell me the, the purchase amount of a laptop sale transaction. It can go into my RDBMS, it can crawl through the records, find, match the records and it can tell me the answer. But in doing so, it just does a matching of characters. Suppose if I ask it to look up for Mr. David Jones record, as long as I give the name completely in line with what it what it knows in its database, which is a word to word match like D A V I D Jones, it can it can uh, run that query and get me the answer. But if my query is anything different, like say if I say Dave Jones it doesn't know that David Jones is the same as Dave Jones, whereas a human being can know. So we know how to deal with these word variants, how to deal with the pet names of human beings or various other things. There are thousands of things that we know that a computer doesn't know. We take them for granted when we think, when we answer, and when we do our day-to-day -day activities. But these are alien to a computer. To see these problems in uh, a bit more depth, you can take this example. If I ask uh, Watson a question of where was Einstein born, it may crawl through the information. Uh, we have actually uh, fed Watson with a lot of information before sending it to the Geopardy game. We took the complete dump of Wikipedia articles. The from officially from Wikipedia. So we took a dump of that as <coughs> text file and we dumped it into a hard disk. We also took the last 10 years New York Times news article again as plain text and we dumped it. We also dumped few known sets of information like this which is very much in the public domain and we dumped all of this and then we connected that to Watson. And remember we didn't connect Watson to internet when it is playing. So it was all offline with this information that we have provided to Watson. It's up to Watson how to read that information, how to process, and how to answer the question. So even if Watson comes across a piece of unstructured data in a Wikipedia article or in a news article, like one day from his city, views of he 
chose to send a watercolor to Albert, uh, to Einstein's birthplace. Now, are we talking about the same Einstein here? We are not sure. And it's very difficult for a computer to synthesize and the meaning of this sentence, decompose that into the actual uh, message which, which is conveyed and answer the question with 100% uh, confidence. If it is a structured data, for example, if it had access to uh, a table which had the list of physical physicists and their birthplaces in a table, it is very, very easy for a computer to just look up for Einstein and then tell that one is his birthplace. But the problem is to deal with that unstructured data and still answer the questions. Uh, anybody who is working on big data space will understand better on uh, the problems of dealing with this unstructured data. But to compound that, Watson also deals with understanding the semantics of the in language, natural language, to find an, an answer to that. <coughs> Another example is uh, uh, when we ask Welsh ran this, it needs to understand that this there uh, in the question refers to a company. So it needs to know what is a company, what is a person, what is the dependency between a person and a company. People work for a company, people run companies. So it needs to know these basics. Another example, uh, if I give a text like in cell division, uh, mitosis splits the nucleus and uh, uh, kytokinesis splits, splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus, you need to know what is the meaning of liquid there. Liquid is not just a word that we can run a, a search and then find an answer to the question. Because you may find across various types of references to liquid. In some places, for example, in the actual answer, there will be a reference to cytoplasm is a fluid surrounding the nucleus. So if you know that fluid is a liquid, you can very well tell the answer. But the key issue for a computer is to know that basic simple thing. So it needs to run uh, some uh, tests to evaluations to see is a liquid a fluid, is a fluid a liquid, or liquid and fluid one and the same. So it needs to ask questions like this and check for the answer of the questions again before it answers the main question. So we call that as uh, identifying the candidate answer and then checking for further evidence for that. We first pass the sentence, we crawl through all the vast amounts of information available, we crawl through that and identify the key tokens <coughs> and then from them we, generali uh, we generalize uh, the fragments that we identified and try to uh, frame candidate answers. Then we evaluate each one, we rank them, we score them and then we check for uh, matching evidence for that, then Batson will tell the answer. This shows the uh, very complex type of uh, question that can be put to a computer. Even for human beings this will be very tough. If I ask a question like in May 1998 Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer's arrival in India. We are from India, so we know the history of India and the, and the complete colonial story, so we know what Kodagama is the answer. But we need to see how a computer performs this. There are Wikipedia articles and there are news articles from the Times of India, Hindu, and a computer can crawl through all these texts and find references. Uh, first, let's say the question is broken down into tokens and it identifies these tokens like celebrated May 1998, 400th anniversary, Portugal, India, arriving, explorer, and then it tries to search, search in the uh, vast amount of articles that it finds and see if there is any bloody match, word to word match. But highly unlikely it will find a word to word match. Suppose if it finds an article which says in May Gary arrived in India and some text where Gary is the name. Other keywords are matching like Portugal, celebrated, India. 
but it needs to reconfirm that Gary is the answer by looking at other references where Gary is found in its information or any uh, secondary proof that Gary is the match for that. So as it checks it, its uh, in information repositories again, it may come across another another uh, statement somewhere else like on 27th May 1498 Vasco da Gama landed in Kapad Beach. This looks totally unrelated to the text that we read. At least for a computer who tries to do word to word match or pattern matching or search. But if you try to uncover the real meaning of that, there are certain advanced uh, verifications that we can do. For example, temporal reasoning to see what is the uh, actual meaning of 27th May 1498. If you know what is today's date, and if you can, if you know how to do back traversal of the dates to find uh, what is 400 years ago, you will know that both are same. This is something that is out of text pattern matching or the text processing that we normally know. But this is related to natural language processing in the context of understanding the questions and answering them. Similarly, uh, in in the last. Uh, text that we identified, there was a reference to India, but here is, there is a reference to Kappad Beach. Through geospatial reasoning, we can uh, find out that Kappad Beach is actually a beach in Can uh, Kerala, which is in India. So we know things are getting closer to, to, to believe that this answer is more accurate. And by doing this type of study, uh, many rounds through all the articles it has, and finding all candidate answers and scoring them, Watson will be able to find the right answer for that. Let's compare how a, a search engine works and what is different in Watson. For a search engine, the decision maker or you who is trying the search need to, need to know what exactly you are looking for, what type of wordings to submit for search query so that it gives the correct answer. So the responsibility on getting the right answer lies on the person who is asking. What you ask is what you get. So you ask a question by giving the right keywords, it finds the documents matching and gives you the reference to them and you, you are at your liberty again to open those documents, read them, understand them, look for the evidence whether that is the information you are looking for or not and then you proceed on your work. The search engine just returns the document matching to the keywords. And this is definitely not what we are talking about in Watson. And remember in GeoParty game, we didn't even connect that to internet. So there's no point of running a Google query with the keywords in the question. In an expert system, the decision maker's role can be very minimal because he just asked the question. And it is the responsibility of the system to understand the question, decipher the real meaning, the semantics, of the question and produce possible answers for that, look for evidence for each of the answer, pick up the answer which makes maximum sense, which is most probable has maximum evidence in the information that you know, which is relevant to the context of the tone of the question and then it, it delivers the answer. The decision maker in the, in the expert assisted mode will just consume the answer and take the evidence and he will just proceed. This is the level where we want to bring the computers. We want to bring the, elevate the computers from the search engine based document repositories and algorithm based processors to a place where they can assist a human being in our field of work in the way we converse with experts sitting next to us in the table. That is the system of what? Now I'll show you one slide on the technology behind Watson and the kind of uh, architecture or algorithms behind that. When you first throw a question, uh, it first does a decomposition of the question to see the keywords, tokens and the structure of the sentence there. It matches that with the uh, grammar and the semantics of the language that it knows and try to uncover the key things of importance. Then it, it tries to sense what is the question, what exactly is the this here refers to. 
is it a person, is it a place, so it, it senses that first. And then it finds all other things in relation to that as uh, the tokens of information which is given, which will be the candidate for an initial search across the vast information that it has. Watson is fed with several terabytes of information. Uh, we, when we put it to Geopardy, uh, we actually attached 20 terabyte of uh, hard disk to that and 16 terabytes of RAM was attached to that so that uh, speed will be um, in, in milliseconds and it is uh, equipped with very good uh, computational power. It's actually a super computer. It's not a uh, laptop or a desktop. It's a computer with 10 rack servers of uh, IBM P750 power systems uh, uh, equipped with 15 terabyte of RAM. So it's able to do 80 trillion operations uh, which is called as petaflops. 80 petaflops of operations in one second. We also try to uh, run the same algorithms of Watson on normal computers. Uh, it does because uh, it's a computer which runs the algorithm. So it is able to do the same thing in several hours. So to speed up the system, we made it as a supercomputer and uh, we brought it to 80 uh, petaflops speed. At that speed, it searches across 1 million books, which is normally equal to uh, 200 million pages of information in less than three seconds before uh, it answers the questions there. So at that processing caliber and the computational resource availability, it, it crawls through the vast amount of uh, information which is available to it for every question that is answered and it does a preliminary search of what are all the documents or the pieces of information which may have the answer that I am looking for, for this question, for these tokens, for this context. It notes down a set of candidate answers. For each candidate answer, it then runs several tests to see, is this a place? Is this a place where the person I'm looking for has lived? So it looks for a, 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 a tabular information of people, places, where they lived, relationship across all the information that it knows, and then revalidate that the set of answers that it noted down will make sense, and it ranks them. So it looks for deep evidence scoring for all the candidate answers and then it checks each answer on multiple other parameters uh, like the temporal analysis and other analysis. Uh, we also introduced a, a sentiment analysis to understand the pun, wit and the humor of human languages. It scores on all these and then comes up with a set of answers. Again, the, the top answer that it picks up will not be a zero or one answer. It will never be a 100% sure answer. It will only rank in their relative merit of being the correct answer and it throws the topmost answer. But as we have put Watson for GeoPiDy test, it turned out that what Watson predicts as the topmost answer came as the correct answer in many case places. It was also wrong in some places. It is possible that the information which we have fed to Watson was insufficient to answer the type of question or it may not have done the right level of uh, deep evidence searching in the amount of time which is given, uh, given to that. All these are, as you can note, the way that we human beings behave. When you ask a question and I put you on a buzzer round, you will just think for whatever depth of thinking that you can do in the time and you will tell some answer. You don't quit. That's how humans work and we made Watson to work like that. We also what, uh, made Watson to recall through its information at its best ability and then just leave beyond what it can't do. So we made this system to behave like human brain. That's, that's the underpin that, uh, that drove the architecture of Watson. So, when we made Watson to play the GeoParty game and win physical green dollars money in, in real human beings world, uh, we then brought this question of what can Watson do in other businesses in the real world. 
can it help banks can it help say insurances healthcare governments how exactly then then as we explored it we partnered with uh, several top firms and we continued to do this research uh, we checked several things on how uh, a computer can process information build its expertise and then improve on uh, the knowledge that it has and then uh, work more and more so we started with the healthcare in industry where uh, <coughs> there are complex challenges the the research data uh, suggests that one in every five diagnoses are inaccurate because the doctor did not have all the data or or we didn't have enough opportunity to go through the complete case and give the proper diagnosis same goes in medicine recommendation or evaluation of the test results so there is a great need of an expert help in the healthcare industry so we focused on that and then we we uh, evaluated that further we discovered that if we can build a system which converses in human language and people can answer questions that would be a great deal of help for healthcare industry so we took up this case and we we uh, built our uh, smarter healthcare solutions around this by uh, making Watson as part of the healthcare industry solutions of IBM, and we took up one uh, very good use case to try. When a doctor uh, does a diagnosis for a patient, the patient comes with a lot of symptoms. When the doctor starts the conversation, he doesn't know what is the disease, so he patiently listens to all the symptoms. But in the due course, the patient also tells a lot of non-symptoms, which are the negative matches for particular diseases. And an expert doctor will identify the symptoms, match that to a disease, which doesn't have the non-symptoms, and then he comes up with a medicine. Again, the success rate of the medicine will be a gut feel by the doctor, depending on what he has as, as his expertise. So we wanted to try how Watson can help in this space assisting a doctor so we took all the records uh, we used a different set of information instead of Wikipedia articles and New York Times articles which are ideal for Geopardy's case here we dumped Watson with the medical records of the US patients and the records collected from the uh, drug manufacturing companies on all the medicines which are available in the market the uh, medical trials that they have done patient history records and lot of uh, industry from the medical journals we dumped all of that so a machine doesn't uh, know what exactly is the information so it know it it learns on its own as it encounters the questions so as we uh, put Watson for this use case it started learning what a disease is what a person is and the simple principles of the world that a person will get a disease and the medicine will cure that then what are all the medicines available, what medicine was given for what diseases and what was the result, so which medicine works for which disease. So it started learning all these things. And in the due course when a new patient comes and, and when we ask a question of what could be the probable disease and what should be the medicine I give, it checks for the symptoms of that patient, non-symptoms of the patient and then it comes up with few candidate answers, it scores and ranks them and but it's still doesn't recommend it checks for further evidence so it checks for the family history of this particular patient to see what could be the most probable uh, disease in line with additional information discovered from the family history similarly it can also check for the uh, patient history before uh, coming to this doctor where all the patient has gone uh, what ailments the patient has got in, in his or her lifetime apart from the family members health and that can also be taken into account and if there are any diagnostic tests which are done or any medications which are taken by the patient even they will be considered and across all these things then it firms up the candidate answers with further evidence searching advanced evidence matching to tell what is the most probable disease and the drug that you can recommend for this patient but it would only acts as an assistant to the doctor so it's it puts all this information to the doctor on what it discovered why it thinks it could be the disease and the evidence that it has found in so on for medical journals or 
uh, whatever reports or this patient's records and then the doctor will finally uh, communicate the, the disease and the medication to the patient. So we made it non-invasive. It doesn't take over our world but it can act as a helper to the human beings beyond what a computer can do as of now. Many, many levels beyond what a computer can do today. And we try to bring it as close to a skilled subject matter expert sitting next to you who can assist you. We try to uh, discover further use cases and uh, in the last couple of years we have been trying Watson in many more industries after trying in healthcare. Uh, there are dozens of uh, clients who are working on research projects with us uh, across healthcare, insurance, banking, governments. Uh, we are helping in uh, crime analysis. We have a lot of uh, uh, police records, criminal databases, cases from the courts and investigation reports. So we, want, we are making Watson crawl through all of that and identify the pattern in which uh, the crime happened in the past and to observe the real, real uh, time happening of various things from various sources if it thinks there is something to be suspicious, uh, something suspicious. This is again a subjective thing, it's not a binary logic. We can never say there is a fraud happening right now. But this is where we need systems like Watson who can deal with the gradients of truth and they can still suggest some things where we need to focus. We are also uh, putting Watson on uh, quality insights and uh, analysis of the uh, customer information that we have, customer loyalty, customer perceptions for customer care and on insurance frauds analysis. So today Watson is operational across healthcare, financial services, helping in, in investments and uh, decision support, fraud analysis, retirement planning, customer care, knowledge management, consumer insight, public safety, security. Watson is helping in all these areas. If you want to know more about Watson on what exactly it can do for the type of uh, industries that you are from, you can visit this YouTube channel where a lot of recorded uh, videos are there. The complete Geopardy play is there as well as all other videos on how Watson works, what exactly it is and uh, what people who use Watson are saying all are there. And you can also uh, visit that website ibmwatson.com or there is a Facebook page and uh, tweet handler for that and the YouTube. If you want to work on Watson, I can also show you a few pointers. The first thing is Watson is not something that came from say out of the world. It was built on what IBM has been working on and we just put all things, all pieces together and we made Watson. So it is very much possible for you to consume the, the constituent technologies out of which Watson is made, even though the complete Watson may be inaccessible to us uh, for buying per se. Uh, so there are technologies on processing of the data, uh, enterprise data management, things like federation of the data, governance, analysis, master data management, warehousing, or in business analytics to deal with uh, customer analytics, predictive analytics. Uh, GRC and compliance management of the uh, data, enterprise content management to deal with the files, text files, unstructured files to deal with data in different different formats, social content analytics, uh, so document image management. We have all these uh, softwares which are already available and in this slide I am going to show you all the IBM products which were used uh, in this Watson technology. We have uh, in business analytics space, we have Cognos, SPSS, predictive analytics uh, and in the data management space, we have Big Insights which is a Hadoop based big data platform of IBM. We have data warehouses, cloud offerings and we have uh, uh, consumer insight in the social media space. We also have customer analytics, brand research, connections, content an an analytics. So these are all the constituent technologies which are already in several products shape which you can start with and we visualize a roadmap of starting points. So starting from one 
uh, entry level starting point you can uh, act on your data get to work on your data understand that and then add text processing to that natural language understanding features to that and you are you are close to what Watson can do or you will be ready for uh, operating at Watson level of uh, uh, technology processing or the other approach is we have a Watson ecosystem program this is more applicable for IBM's business partner we have put Watson on a public cloud and we are building an ecosystem we have given APIs on how you can program Watson for new use cases uh, for example, we pro we programmed Watson for playing a Jeopardy game by understanding the answer and coming up with a question by searching it in Wikipedia articles, New York Times news articles and answering the Jeopardy question. The case we tried in healthcare is totally different. There it dealt with a different set of information. It dealt with uh, patients, uh, diseases, diagnosis, the diagnostic tests, doctors, medicines and the right treatment of medicine for the disease. It's a totally different case. But the underpinning thing is the same logic of a Watson, the three core principles, understanding the natural human language, dealing up, dealing with various gradients of truth than just a binary logic, learning on its own and then harvesting what it learns on a androgenic learning pattern. These can be applied. So using these patterns of the fundamental concept of Watson, you can train Watson for any new use case. So we made APIs for that and we can give you a cloud based API if you want to uh, help us enrich the Watson capability to help it in various other scenarios. So we look for three types of partners in that. We look for an application partner who brings the application. Uh, playing Geopardy can be one application, patient diagnosis assisting can be one application and there can be many applications like fraud analy analysis or uh, portfolio analysis in a financial uh, scenario or security analysis for a government. These are all applications. So you can visualize your own application and then bring it to us to uh, to, to develop and, and uh, test that application on Watson and as well offer that to clients. You will still be the owner of the application on Watson uh, which works as a platform in that case. And we also look for content partners. We dealt with uh, GK information in the form of Wikipedia and news articles for Geopardy but when it came to healthcare we required the data of uh, healthcare nature, patients, medicines, the medicines which are developed by drug manufacturing companies which will be their proprietary information and the patient history records which will be in a health information exchange under the US government's control. So we look for more and more information to come into the <coughs> into the domain of Watson so that so that it can read through that. And this information will be uh, proprietary information. So there will be royalty. It could be uh, industry reports or it could be some analysis done by uh, some uh, expert firms or it could be a raw data which is tabulated out of various sources that they studied, any information. So we also look for content partner uh, and we will be tying up an arrangement with them. We will be paying them and we, as we charge from the end consumer for that. This is another type of partner. And a third type of partner is a talent partner who understands these APIs, who brings the brains to uh, build this new set of applications. But at, predominantly we are looking for application partners at this point of time. And from Indian point of view, application partners and talent partners is what we are mainly looking for because content partners uh, are signed up a lot from uh, matured markets already. So. Uh, I hope you have uh, got a fair understanding of what Watson is and how it performs and what it can do. Now I open up for questions and uh, I will look forward. Thanks for the insightful presentation, Subramaniam. Let's uh, quickly take up the questions now. I request you to read out the questions and their answers so that all our users may listen to the insights. Are you able to access the question stock? 
Uh, yeah, and maximizing that. Sorry, I'm not able to read those questions there. I have, oh yeah, I see two questions. How Watson will uh, figure out the correlation problem in the context of natural language? Uh, this is asked by uh, Mr. Yogesh Patel. Uh, the best answer I can give for that is, this is the application of Watson. So, there is a uh, initial programming that we do to understand uh, the basic <coughs> type of information that it works on. For example, how to identify a person and how to identify a phone number of a person. A typical example I can give is, uh, if, if you come across something like Mr. Dot, M R Dot and something follows after that, that could be the name of a male. Similarly, we know how to identify uh, misses something, miss something, or uh, in, a, in a letter communication, if we come across uh, dear space and something, that could be the name of a person. It could prob uh, probably the call name of a person, and in the due course, you can identify uh, what is the associated information. So, as, as a computer crawls through this text, there are little patterns that it can look for which identify the key tokens. But the real semantics of the of the token is something very crucial. So you need to know what is the difference between a place name and a person name, what are the attributes of a person, attributes of a place, how they differ, how they function uh, in interrelation in a language, that's all is Watson about. So as you work on the Watson APIs, the good thing is you don't need to worry about that because we have taken care of these basic things of language semantics analysis pre-built into Watson and you just need to uh, point it to new sources of information and guide it to refine its set of uh, patterns like this. For example, uh, say phone number. Assuming we didn't feed that uh, phone number recognition pattern into Watson. It's very pretty simple for you to do. Uh, if you come across something like a three digits, hyphen, three digits, hyphen, four digits, it's most probably a US phone number. And if you study the sentence in which this is used, if there are reference to please call me at, here you can reach me, this is my home number, that means it's a phone number. So there are text recognition patterns which can be fed to Watson, which are then elaborated by Watson and continued in its self-learning process. Did that answer your question? Okay, the next question I see here is whether Watson needs data in specific format. Okay, this is a good question. Uh, if you have uh, uh, got the central message, uh, I reinforced that we never fed structured information to Watson and we didn't want to even though uh, we could do to some extent. So we fed the dump of New York Times news articles or Wikipedia articles in the raw shape that it came to us like a bunch of text files dumped into a disk location. And we didn't do even any pre-processing on that. We didn't put that into a structured format, we didn't clean that, we didn't organize that, we didn't categorize that, we did nothing on that data. We just dumped the article and we we pointed Watson to that. So it knows the location where it is, it can read the files because it's a computer and it knows how to read the text and we gave a simple algorithms to understand what is the grammar of the English language, how to identify what is a noun, pronoun, verb, how a verb is related to a noun. It means the actor is doing an action. So we just give that simple logic to it. Beyond that, it has built its own structured information required. Suppose if it were to answer a question on where somebody was born, it were to identify all the person names in its vast amount of the document base and identify who are all the persons that it comes across, what are all the places it comes across, where it 
identifies a person being born in second place, note that down as candidate answer, rank them and look for further evidence on what is the place where the person in the question is born all by itself. We didn't assist in that space at all. The next question uh, comes from Srikant. What is the process of using Watson services integration with application partner? I mean the uh, access to the APIs and whom to contact? This is a good question. Actually in the amount of time I have just shown you one slide, now I will elaborate. We look for three partners and there is a very clear partner onboarding process. Uh, because this is a very niche technology where even our resources are pretty limited. The Watson team is a very small team. So we don't want to uh, put this like a public beta and then deal with thousands of people trying that. We just want a handful of very focused, qualified, sincere partners with a very cl clear vision on how they want to reap on the Watson technology to make their business. So we have a uh, pre-qualification once you make the uh, expression of interest. We will ask you a set of questions on what business do you do, what is your view of Watson, uh, what type of use case you want to build on Watson, in what time frame, so we will be specific. And we will also ask you a few business questions. Uh, how much do you see the potential of Watson application that you are going to build? So it will not be just a developer level answer. The complete firm needs to be ready to partner with us to work on the Watson. And then once the partner is evaluated and we onboard them. We give all the required documentation uh, for this API and the cloud login access to, to put your questions and then uh, the application development. And we also uh, uh, give you the necessary technical help as you do that work. But there will be a cutoff. We give that only for 12 weeks. In 12 weeks time, you are supposed to make full use of that access given and build an artifact, at least an initial artifact, and then put it on the Watson ecosystem for public access so that your uh, version 1 of your application will be ready in that time frame. Then you can continue on that and build whatever other stuff you want. This is how we want to take it forward. So the initial step is expressing your interest to us, connecting to uh, IBM, IBM India or uh, any other IBM uh, uh, contact points you have on and talking to that on behalf of your organization. And the next question uh, comes from Amlan Dave uh, asking whether Watson can deal with images and sounds. Good question. Uh, it can deal because we mean to refer to any source of information which humans have access to. Suppose if I give you access to uh, a library which has uh, all the movie DVDs or all the songs and you read, you go through that and you converse on the knowledge that you gain from that, we expect a computer also to do the same because we want the Watson computer to act like how human beings gather, harvest and act on the knowledge. So there are accelerators to Watson which can deal with even unstructured information, non-structured uh, uh, sources like binary and uh, uh, voice and video sources also. In fact, it's not just new to Watson. Uh, if you see the underlying technologies I have shown, Watson is built on the big data platform. We have an offering called Infosphere Big Insights which is built on Hadoop, but we have also added lot of accelerators from IBM side uh, which can deal with uh, over 30-40 uh, different types of uh, data sources including voice file. In one of the use cases of Infosphere Big Insights, we tied up with a telecom call center and we accessed the digital recording of the calls conversation with the customers. <coughs> we did a text synthesis from that and then we assisted the call center representatives on the holistic view of the customer, all his previous interactions and the details about him beyond what you have in the customer uh, management database, which answers 
uh, which helps the customer representative to address the client concern or serve him better. Watson builds on all of these technologies which IBM already has. So the answer to the question is yes, Watson can deal with any type of information. Any other questions? Subramaniam, I think we are uh, done with the questions for today. Uh, so if you would like to sum up the session, you can do it now. Okay, uh, so it was a, 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 a great time having you in my session and I hope I have added a little bit of value to you by uh, explaining a futuristic breakthrough technology from IBM which is going to revolutionize the IT and probably uh, many more IT players entering into this space of cognitive systems. So watch out more for this technology and if possible go through the YouTube videos that I have given and do contact IBM if you want to have any next steps on, on this either to tie up with us as a partner or to be a, a, a client and leverage these technologies for your business you are uh, encouraged to do so. And thanks for giving me an opportunity to speak to you today. Have a good day. Right. I'm really thankful to our guest speaker today for conducting this wonderful webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the webinar will be available on techgig.com by tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Subramaniam, for all your time. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Bye.